Wouldn't it be great if it was just like it was in Acts where God was actually healing people these days and you could see the power of God? I mean, wouldn't it be great that that does exist? We're just not doing it right. We're not, we're not tapping into God's power. We're not. Hey, this is Unrefined Podcast. I'm Brandon Spain, your host, with co-host Lindsay Waters. Welcome to another episode. Hey, 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 everybody. This is Brandon and my co-host, Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, looking forward to getting into this one with Ryan. Yeah, yeah, we have a... uh, Special guest on our podcast today, a guy that met, I met his wife first, but then I met him, and I read his amazing book. Lindsay and I both read his amazing book, and what we want to do today is we want to promote his book, talk about his book, but also just talk about his life and his experiences with the supernatural, because that's you know that's what we as a podcast are all about. And so we just want to pick his brain and and let him just tell us what all he has to say in what all God's laid on his heart. And so let me introduce him a little bit. He grew up in South Carolina. He now lives in the, the, the country of Texas, which is what I love to call it, which I agree with. He's married to his wife of 20 years, raising four wonderful boys. He works in home bathroom remodeling, and he's written two books and working on a third. And the one we're going to talk about today is A Little Ways Off. That's the book that we're going to discuss and, and we want to get out there for everybody to read and to purchase it. So, Ryan, tell us. I mean, I gave you a little inter- yes. introduction there. Tell us yeah, about yourself. Yeah, I appreciate yourself. that. That's great. Well, I mean, yeah, it's just that. Um, did grow up in South Carolina. Not necessarily want to repeat everything, but I met my wife on a children's workers conference. I was traveling with a church I was uh, attending, and we were going through and teaching churches how to minister to kids. And I met her family on a retreat and on, on one of those ad- adventures and um, was introduced to her, you know, 20 years ago. And so that's pretty much how I got to Texas. She, the, the conference was in Texas. So I went to Texas mm. and was, what's really funny, this is just kind of a, a side thing, but when I first drove in, it was, it happened to be Lubbock, Texas, uh, where we were, you know, living at the time where she was living at the time. And when I, when I drove into the state, I said, oh my, or not the state, I went drove into the, the, the town, the city. Of Lubbock, I said, "Man, this place is horrible. I would never live here." And of course, you know, I ended up me and my wife and moving there. So that's just kind of, kind of the way it goes. Never say never. But uh, so yeah, so we, you know, twenty years. It'll be twenty years this November. Actually, uh, we have our twenty-year wedding anniversary this November, and awesome. so we get the yeah, it's super exciting, super exciting, and we get the blessing of raising four boys. I do have all the way from six to sixteen. That's gross, awesome. awesome. But yeah, yeah. so um. But also been in ministry most of my life in different aspects, um, children's minister, youth minister, um, different things. But God put it on my heart to write a book, the one we're talking about today, A Little Ways Off, mainly because it was, it was an experience that I went through in college. And it dealt with the paranormal. It dealt with the occult. And I, I got deep into it. Um, and... For most of my life, I really just kind of kept it to myself. I didn't really share it with too many people because I was really embarrassed about it. As I look back, Mm. I was embarrassed of all the things I went through. I was embarrassed that I experienced it. And I felt like it was just me. Like this was, this only happened to me and a few people, no one would relate to it. Um, This is just, and and that's really what the enemy, the the main lie the enemy tries to tell you is that you're alone in this and no one's going to relate. You, what you're experiencing is exclusively you. So you might as well just mm. go away and hide somewhere. And that's how I felt for a long time, even though I'd been set free and delivered from it. Um, I, I, I felt like I couldn't do it. But, but and through the years, I've seen that the need for this type of story and telling people my experience is, is more important than ever. Um, we're spiritual beings at a root. We're spiritual beings who are drawn to the spiritual world. And if we don't have direction, from the Spirit of God and, and good teaching, we will naturally fall into that dark side of the spiritual world without even thinking about it. 
we just naturally will be gravitating to. And we're seeing that more than ever today. We're seeing that. Um, I mean, it's just there, there's people going around. Um, in fact, it's even, it's even crazier. There's people that are saying they're quote unquote Christ centered, even though it's not even about Christianity or the true gospel, it's about becoming a Christ awareness or becoming your own God. And, and twisting scripture and, and twisting those things for your own purpose to feel that you've gained some spiritual awareness. So um, I, I just, over the years, I realized, wait a second, there is more people dealing with this type of subject than I would have ever thought. And God said, you, you need to write this. You need to share the story and you need to let people know that there's deliverance in him. So in Jesus. So that's pretty much uh, why I wrote the story and, and kind of why... Um, I guess why we're here right now. So once again, Brandon and Leslie, thank you for having me on. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, yeah. man. Yeah. How did you come up with the title for the book, Ryan? You know, I, I had, it was almost finished. And I was, I had come up with so many different titles thinking, you know, just things that I thought might be clever for it. And I just decided one day, I was like, wait a second, let me just ask God. Like, God, what, what should I, what should I name this book? And I literally just kind of heard it on the inside, kind of that still small voice I heard a little ways off. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh. And so I started thinking about that. I started thinking a little ways off. And really, that's what it was. I had just gotten myself a little way, a little ways off of the truth. I started just going a little bit the wrong direction, which inadvertently mm -hmm. led me completely um, to the wrong way altogether. Like it just, it just started with a little bit. And, um, it's kind of like the idea. And I know I touched this on in the book toward the end, but, but the idea of a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Um, yeah. you just get a little bit of that a little bit is going to start, start you down a path that you don't want to go. And so, so it was God gave me that title. Well, it reminds, wow. reminds me of the, uh, I guess it's a, a popular analogy of a, a boat is a few degrees off when it leaves shore. When it gets further out, it's it's not just a few degrees off anymore. It's a lot of degrees off when you're you're sailing. Oh yeah, or, or, yeah, nautically or whatever. And and so yeah, you start out a little ways off, and then next thing you know, you're a little way a little ways in, and then you're a lot of a lot of ways in. So it just kind of seems I like I love that. Suck, suck, just kind of sucked sucked you in. So um, the the story is. I mean, it, it's it's pretty obvious to me. It was autobiographical, but you made it fiction. So, why did you decide to make it fiction and and go into details in the story that that were fictional? And obviously, we don't want to know names and all that kind of stuff. But just what was fictional and what wasn't <laughs> fictional, you know? And uh, I was constantly Man, that, wondering that when I was question. reading when I was reading the yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, the funny thing is, and it's, I, I tried my hardest. I, this was my, it just kind of my own personal thought on it. I wanted to make it as true to the actual events as possible. I didn't yeah. want to embellish any of it. Um, I have a friend that wrote a book recently, and it's about a story, you know, it's not dealing with me. But it happens to some people in my town. He's, he just kind of wrote a personal story about some things that happened. And I know the stories that he's writing about. However, he embellished. He added things. He took some things from different places. And even though the, the elements were there and it's still true to a point, he really embellished. But I, I didn't want to do that. So in actuality, every single thing that happened, happened pretty much like that. If, if anything, I took more of the day-to-day -day stuff out and tried to make it more of a coherent you know, A, B, C, D, all the way down to the, to the end and, and try to make it flow. But really, I, other than, other than, um, okay, I will tell you this, there, there is, there's one thing that was different. And I, I just felt like at the time it wasn't important to put this in here, but there's an event where, um, toward the end of the story where I feel like, and I don't want to, I mean, it may sound weird to the viewers if I jump ahead so far, but, um, I may, just quickly give a quick synopsis to kind of help, you know, catch anybody up. But, but basically I'll kind of just start like this and then come back and answer that question. The beginning of the book starts with me and a friend basically wanting to just have fun and mess around with some people 
that believe in vampires. These two girls, we kind of overhear them talking about vampires. We think it's so funny that they believe in it. And so mm -hmm. we come up with this idea to trick them into believing that we are vampires or that I'm a vampire. I kind of like ran with it and, and my friend kind of just, just watched me do it. But um, we wanted to trick this girl that we were vampires. By doing that, and overall, the kind of theme of the book is seeds, seed time and harvest, where the things you sow mm. will come back. And if you sow bad, if you sow evil, unfortunately, you will start to reap those things. And so I deceived this girl, but what was even more sad is she started to believe it to the point it affected her on a personal level, which opened up the door for not only me to be deceived, but um, to fall into that same thought process of despair and sadness and confusion while being deceived myself. And so um, there's a time period where I believe that just based on talking to some friends that black cats are not necessarily a bad thing, but a good thing and a sign of warning. And so I get um, three, I see three black cats over the course of a couple of minutes. And it freaks me out so bad that I call a friend of mine to come and, and help me. However, there was the, one of the other characters, Susan, was actually with me at that time. She had come to town and she was with me um, and she experienced that with me. And so it was unusual because she didn't know what I was going through. She didn't know what I had gotten myself into. And so I was trying to deal with my friend and her and keep those separate, but at the same time, get some sort of protection psychically and, uh, that I thought I needed. So she was with me. So that would be the only thing that was that I had changed, but everything else, pretty much, I, I didn't embellish. I, I kept it as true to the events as I possibly could. And other than maybe a couple of um, small little connections to connect the dots, everything is pretty much 100% true how it happened. And I tried to do that on purpose. Cool. Does that yeah. answer your question in the, in the way that you were yes. asking? Yes. Yeah. I couldn't remember if it was, who was the girl that in the book that you told first? It wasn't, I, I wanted to say it was Susan, but it was, it was, uh, uh it was Ida, her, her friend, Ida. Ida. Yeah. Yeah. Ida. yeah. 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 And so you, you asked why I wrote it as fiction. The, the main, the main reason is because I, I truly didn't want to embarrass all of the people mm. that were in the book. And, and some of the things that are, are highlighted are negative and don't present them in a positive light necessarily. And so right. I, I don't, I want to protect, I want to protect their, uh, protect them. A lot of these people I've lost touch with. So I don't know where they are in, in life right now. I don't know the things they've gone through. I don't know if they've got their own redemption or if things have changed for them for the better. I'm not sure. And so I wanted yeah. to make sure that one, it was enjoyable to read. So I wanted to make it enjoyable, but I also wanted to make it factual to the events. And I wanted to protect the people that were involved. That was pretty much the reason. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it was great. You go into your experiences kind of with the occult in there. Do, do you have any other experiences like with UFOs and the, the supernatural? Maybe that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I think what, and, and I'll get into the book here in just a minute. We'll get a little more detailed with the storyline. Um, I don't yeah. mind sharing it. The, the point is, is helping people. Um, when I was younger, before the book, and I don't, I don't touch on this a whole lot in the book. And I, and, and in fact, I really felt like God told me not to put this in here specifically, but, um, I I'll share, share with you some of this now, but when I was a lot younger, I started hearing people talking and I literally could, could hear them. It was as if they were talking about me, but I couldn't see them. And it, it, it was, it was weird. And I felt like it was audible, but it was also in my mind, but I really felt like I could hear people talking. And, and so I got somehow, I convinced myself, and even though no one said anything to me, no one even presented this as an idea or an option or any sort of thing, or I didn't run into someone else that said this, but I convinced myself at a young age that I must be from another planet. I must be an alien. And wow. I, I started being able to read people's minds at times. There were, there were strange occurrences where I could know what something, know something that was about to happen and it would happen exactly that way. And it happened a handful of times where it was like, okay, this is, this is obviously, you know, this is real. This is, you know, I've got this ability. 
And even though I didn't talk to many people about it, as I got older, I pushed that to the back of my mind and, and tried to believe I made it up. But I would still have those occurrences where I would kind of know situations. I would, I would yeah. see things. This makes part of your book make more sense to me now, because now I see that when you, which we'll get into, but when you, I forget which female character was you saying, I know you're psychic, you know, and, and it was it Ida or Susan. And so you hearken back to those past experiences. And so well, maybe there is some truth to what they're saying. That makes a, make a lot more sense to me. Anyway, that's just, I just want to throw that in there. <laughs> no, so. no, I appreciate that. And, and yeah. one other thing, I, I didn't touch on this in the book, um, but there was a yeah. small time period. And I, as I, I kind of, as I got older, I wrestled back and forth with um, trying to live for God. I was a Christian. I understood the things of God to a point but I would go back and forth with this. And there was a small time period where I had developed this odd ability. And, and I can tell you what I believe it is now. However, where I could close my eyes, look around. And if I was looking for something, if I had lost something, I could almost see it in my mind where it was. And I would go to that place and I would find it exactly where I thought I saw it in my mind. And I was able mm. to, in fact, there was a girl that had lost a lighter um, I didn't put this in the story either, but there was a girl that had lost the lighter um, in her in her dorm room, and I had just gotten to her room. She was like, I can't find my lighter. She was wanting to to, to light a cigarette, and um, she was searching for her lighter. And I just walked in the room, and I, I just kind of closed my eyes, and I saw where it was. I was like, Oh, it's right there underneath that cover. If you pull that back, and she found it. She was like, What? And so those things um, just aided in my belief or aided in my ability to to fall under that and think okay these things are real this is a part of who i am and d does that make sense so i i can see how that would shed a little more oh light. yeah but for whatever reason I, yeah, but, I didn't feel like i needed to put that into the story yeah that sounds just like i mean i don't know how much tv you watch a lot of christians don't watch tv but we we do it to, for predictive programming but anyway that's another story but but that sounds just like Stranger Things, what Elle would do in Stranger Things, how she could remote view and find people. And, and that, that's a similar type thing. I don't know if you've ever seen that show or not. but uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, I've seen it. Yeah. And, and, and so it, like a remote viewing thing. It's interesting, though. Um, I want to throw this out there, though, because, I mean, I'm assuming what you were going through was like a counterfeit. My wife, though, has a tendency she does this all the time. She asks the Holy Spirit where things are, and the Holy Spirit will show her where things are. And I think the the main difference of what you're talking about is intent. You know, you were operating outside of the domain, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit, whereas she's trying to maintain in that realm of the kingdom and the Holy Spirit. Anyway, and, no, that, and so, that's exactly uh, right. That's that's I, I'm so glad you said that. That that's exactly how I see it. Um, so kind of touching on what we said, before, what I was saying before, yeah. we're spiritual beings and we are made in the image of God. We have giftings and calling that are designed to bring glory mm. to God. However, the gifts and callings are without revoke. And if we choose to use those yeah. in a wrong way, I, I believe, you know, that that's possible. Now, at the same time, I do believe in some situations, in some cases, it is tapping into demonic activity. I mean, you're tapping in and yeah. listening to yeah. evil spirits. Basically, if you think of it like this, there's in this world, there are mainly two influences. You're, things are either going to be influenced by the spirit of God or the spirit of the devil, the spirit of the enemy. That, that's, that's it. And yeah. so if you're not operating in the spirit of God, it's going to be twisted. And so I think even people that have gotten themselves deep in, in witchcraft and different things of that, they have callings on their lives to be warriors for Christ and and use giftings that they have given them given over to the enemy, like prophetic like like prophetic callings. Like exactly, they, they have exactly. a prophetic gift and they've used that to what we call the restricted is what we call it. And then we did an episode about this where people can get into the spirit realm through drugs like DMT and how do you say it, Lindsay? Ayahuasca. Uh, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Yeah, that's. Lindsay is my is my yeah. dictionary, yeah. But we, we did a podcast about that, about going into the spirit realm, either legally or illegally. And so the same would probably hold true with gifts, because this is my big thing. A lot of people, 
really go after new age and new age in the church and all this stuff. But you're right. All power comes from God. It's all about intention and whether you're using it restricted or unrestricted, whether it's the Holy Spirit or whether it's some kind of demonic or the devil. I'm so glad you brought that out. That's so awesome. Hey, my unrefined friends. I just want to tell you guys that I am so thankful that you are my life. Some of our best fans uh, have been writing to us, and, and I'm I just so encouraged about how lives are being transformed and people are getting something out of this podcast. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's why we're doing this, is to glorify Jesus and to just look at the world and have a, a more open view of the seen and the unseen and the supernatural in the world. So while we're doing that, we're going to handle all different kinds of topics. But see, what I'd like for you to be involved in or part of is our members only group. Things that are coming in our members only group that are going to just blow your mind. Not to mention, there's going to be episodes in there that you won't be able to hear just on the normal episode channel. So make sure to visit our website at unrefinedpodcast.com and check out our members only community. I just can't stress the fact that, you know, we're after building a community and there's, there's so much out there, you guys, and there's so much coming, I really believe. We need to build these strong communities of Christ followers to, to be able to handle what might be coming in the, in the future days. We're sure that you'd be a good fit, and we cannot wait. I can't wait to see you there. And I think that's why, I think that's why sometimes you see young children and they'll have accounts of seeing demonic creatures or, or see spiritual things or see something as a young child. And sometimes parents are like, well, no, they just made that up. They didn't really see that. Hmm. But I think what, what the, the enemy is doing is they're, they don't care about age. They'll, they'll go after anybody at any age, um, but they'll see those spiritual gifts that God gave to be a blessing and mm. try to come at an early age to, to capture that, to, to stop that, to stifle that, or change that in some way. And, and so, and I think ultimately the church has done, you know, as a whole, a, a terrible job of presenting mm -hmm. and understanding mm -hmm. things of the Spirit and the power that is in God. And so when you don't mm -hmm. have that, there's a void, and the enemy jumps right in there to try to, to fill that void. And, 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 and then it turns into all about you. Look what I've done. Look what I can do. Look at the, look who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it becomes you centered as opposed to Christ centered. And, and that's when you get yourself into trouble. Amen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen, brother. What do you think? I mean, I really want to get into the book and talk about the watchers and the observers. Wait, wait no, watchers and then the seekers. When seekers seekers and, and the destroyers. Yeah. The destroyers yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to kind of switch gears. And my question is this. Let me ask you this. All right. When you experienced all those things, do you believe that they were real or that it was your imagination? And if it was real, can you go into more detail of what you think it was and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll basically pick up where I was referring to tricking uh, some friends of ours into believing we're vampires and kind of yeah. just flow through the story just a little bit to catch up okay. so that we can you know, get to that point. But basically, so it, it starts out once again, me and these friends, me and my friends decide to mess with these girls, these goth girls that were our friends. So it was really sad because, you know, we were friends with these people, but, you know, I thought it was funny to, to mess with them. And I started tricking them, believing, trying to convince them I was a vampire. It caused this one girl to kind of spiral and go down an even darker path, but I didn't stop there. I continued mm. on and there was, and, and the more, um, it was, it kind of, it was sad, but it became fun to me and that was wrong, it, but it became fun messing with these people. And so I not, not only told her I was, I told other friends and it just opened up this door where one of the main characters in the book, her name is Susan in the book. She's, you know, wise to it all, but why she doesn't tell her friends, I don't know, but she comes up with a ploy to trick me and she wants to, to deceive me. And to the point where she even harms herself physically to make me believe it's real. Now, um, she, she claims that she's being haunted by a, a spirit animal of some kind. And she 
claims that she's been mauled by it and she harms herself physically to make me believe this. But until I started writing the book, I still wasn't sure if that wasn't real, if that didn't really happen to her or if she made it up. But when I was writing the book, I prayed about it. I was like, Lord God, was that real? What happened? And I really felt like God said, no, this was a trick. That um, part of the story that illuminates the fact that it was kind of a ruse from her and her cousin, I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me that and, and told me that this is what really happened. It was, it was her design to mess with you. And so that itself is what opened the door to the end of the book. The fact that I experienced that, um, there was a, a friend of mine who I'd started hanging out with later in the book that was in a band, and, and I kind of knew them, started hanging with them. But I had uh, kind of just mentioned that I had a weird time um, at school with one of my friends, and he wouldn't stop. He was like, what happened? What was weird? And I told him, I said it was, you know, demons and devil crap. I saw some crazy things. And he literally was like, wait, you have to come and talk with me. So he, he brought me over um, and he started sharing with me how he felt like he was an alien and that he and his friends were aliens from another planet. And so based on my younger years, I was like, okay, well, let me hear this out. I'm not just going to immediately dismiss it. Let me see where this goes. And, and so they start telling a story about how they had a shared dream as a kid. They were from another planet, that they felt like I was a part of it, and that they had come up with a shared language. And because of where they were from, the planet that they came from is, I'm not sure if, I can't remember if they felt like they were born to this earth and, and were seated here in some way. I can't remember how they actually mm -hmm. said it, but they felt like they were just born as children. As children, somehow they came into this earth as children. And they said once they came to this earth, the, the people they were escaping from were sending beings to stop them. And they called them watchers, seekers, and destroyers. They would send a watcher out first. The watcher would come and try to find psychically powerful beings. And then if the, the, the watchers found them, they would send seekers to make sure everything was, was correct. They found the right people and then ultimately send a destroyer to come and, and wipe them out. And, and that was how they told it. Now, answering your question, did I, did I see things? So during this time period, um, at first, I saw what he was looking at. I, I kind of saw in the trees and in the distance, some of what he was saying were watchers or seekers. However, I didn't want to believe I saw it. I, I was like, I don't know if I'm seeing this, I see this. But as it progressed, I did see things. I did see uh, beings. Mm. Now, I don't know if I saw them physically or if I was seeing into the spirit world. I don't know exactly how I saw it, but I knew there was something there. And also the atmosphere would always be darker. It would, it would change. And I'll, I'll kind of shift gears for a second. I'll give you a case in point. Um, since leaving this stuff, since getting redeemed, since changing and just, you know, living life, uh, my sons, you know, love to play dress up and, and love to, you know, do cosplay and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And so one day, I, this is kind of a side note, just to kind of help shed light on this. I went into, I wanted to get um, a wig. I think I wanted to find a wig for my son for some sort of costume he was doing or a costume. And I just was driving by and it would happen to be the fall. And I was like, hey, I'll just run to the Halloween store real quick. Well, I, I ran into the Halloween store and literally instantly, the second I walked through the door, it was like just darkness. I, I felt such a heavy weight on my spirit, just walking into the place. I literally had to leave. Couldn't, I was like, I, I got to get out of here. And I felt the presence of darkness in there. And I knew that was, there were spiritual entities. There were spiritual beings. There was a spiritual presence of darkness in there. And at times through my life in that story back then, that's how it felt too. Cause I was already saved. I was, I, I knew God, but I was running from it, trying to seek something different. But so even though I wasn't sure if I was seeing it with my physical eyes or if I was seeing it spiritually, but I knew something was there. And the longer I was in it, the more I could see, the more real it became. But I think I didn't see it as clearly as my friends because I was a Christian. There was that barrier. I mean, I was born again, had a brand new spirit. I was just trying to go there. I was trying to go that direction, I, even though I didn't know any better. You know, I grew up in church, but I grew up Baptist. And, and once again, I, had a, I loved my church growing up. I loved what it is, but they didn't touch on the things of the Spirit ever. 
I didn't know anything about that stuff. So, so I came to a point where I started thinking, well, you know, God is real and this stuff is real and they can be intermingled and it's no problem. And you see that today. You see a lot of people doing that. They're dabbling in witchcraft while also claiming to be Christian. They're dabbling in the occult, a voodoo, whatever the case may be, you know, hillbilly voodoo, all mm -hmm. these different things where they claim that um, it's okay and this is just our heritage. This is just how we grew up. This is what we do. But we also love God. And it's just a blending of those kind of things. And I was trying to do the same thing. And so, so yeah, I, I could see them. And there were times where I was like, oh, yes, there's something there. But they, their experience was more like they could see them. But I, I know they weren't um, Christians and they weren't living for God. And they were deep into it. I mean, it was their life. So d does that make mm. sense? Yes, perfect. Yep, yep, totally. Totally. So there's a few female characters in the books that practice Wicca, they're Wiccans, and that just got me thinking back to the 90s. I started my middle school and teen years in the 90s, and I can remember girls particularly, and some guys too, dabbling with Wicca. It seemed like a very girls, sort of something girls were drawn to. Why do you feel girls were, were so drawn to, to Wicca then and, and now, I guess? You know, you know that, that's, a, that's a great question as well. I, I think, just like you said, it, it is girls and guys. There is something about the camaraderie um, of getting together and feeling important, feeling like you, you, you have a purpose. I, I think we're all designed to, to, to want a purpose, and we were designed with a purpose from God, but we're all designed to want that and to seek that out and to seek some sort of unity and, and connection. And so th I think that's part of it. But also, from my experience, what I've seen is it's more of people that consider themselves or maybe they feel like they're kind of an outcast of society. Maybe they're, they don't fit in very well. And I think um, typically people like that seem to be more drawn to it than others because they're looking for connection. They're looking for a draw. And like I said earlier, since we're spiritual, um, we have that spiritual void. If we don't have God, we still hunger for the things of the spirit, which is really we're hungering for God. We just don't know it. Um, and so we want that connection. We're drawn to it. We sense the realness of that spiritual side. And I think it, it just makes it more tangible to the point where we're like, wait, wait, I want more of this. This is real. And then now I have friends. I have connection. I have uh, a bond with these people and we're sharing these things. So I, I think that's more to it than anything is it's just they, people want to feel a part of something. They want to feel important. They want to feel special. And um, ultimately, we need to find that in God, find our unity and connection in God. But but I think that's really more than anything. The reason is the, just that need to be a part of something, um, the, the, the drawing of that spiritual side. And I, had, I knew a lot of people that were into it as a kid, just kind of messing around with it. And it seemed to always be the people that felt like they weren't uh, accepted by others. You know, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. You know, I think in, in a lot of ways, the, uh, the, you know, I love the bride of Christ, but in a lot of ways, I think it's an indictment on the church that we, we don't make people feel welcome enough to be able to come in and be community and to feel, I'm, I'm not talking about just like any kind of just, you know, come on in and sin and do whatever kind of welcome, but in a real spiritual connection. And like you said, fundamentally at the beginning of the podcast, it's because we lack the church as a whole majority. And that's something we, we set out to, to, to kind of help abolish with our podcast is a supernatural worldview. And I've heard it that the supernatural has been truncated in, in the body of Christ, particularly in the West. And, and when they get there, you know, Either either it's a traditional old church and it's kind of boring to them, or they get to it and it's just basically a, a concert and and a TED talk, and that's boring to them because yeah. they could do that online. Mm -hmm. and, and they want that fellowship, that connection with other like minded people that want to pursue at first just the spiritual, but then it, it leads into the Father. You know, it leads them to the Father because He's the source of the spiritual. And I could totally see what you're talking about. I mean, that's that's so true. They need that connection, and it has to be in a spiritual connection, not just like a you know a social club or a social group or whatever. Only to me, th I think there's something essentially trinitarian about it. They want to they want to be united together by the spirit, and uh, you yeah. can't get that anywhere but the church. So. 
Well, I mean, there are real things they're experiencing, but it's it's just a counterfeit. And and that's part of the deception yeah. is it seems so real, but it's just a counterfeit to what God has. But what I don't like is well, a lot of back when that right? Go ahead, Lindsay. No, I was just gonna throw in the word reenchantment again. <laughs> uh, something that gets that we talk about a lot and something a lot of podcasts in this name talk about this idea that we're in an age of of reenchantment where people are tapping into the supernatural and it's good that people see a supernatural world out there, but it's also bad because, well, which bit of it are they tapping into? You know? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you wonder how the church is going to rise up to, to, you know, meet that need. And I think it's happening now. I think just over the past few years, I think a lot of people's eyes are being open to just, um, I mean, evil is there now and it's, it's out in the open. And so I think, uh, it's just disclosure. It disclosure is happening and, and people are going to need a way to connect with other like-minded people in a spiritual way. And hopefully, and I know, I know, well, because I believe in God's sovereignty in that, in that aspect, it's going to, the church is going to be the answer to that. You know, the church is going to be a, a spotless bride and, and the remnant that's going to, I mean, the church already has become, like you said, a place of liminality. It's become on the edge of, of outlier of, of things. And so maybe that'll start attracting the, the people that are, feel like they don't belong because the church is quickly getting to that place where we don't belong anymore in society. Well, and, and, no, that's, that's exactly right. If people understood the true power of God uh, and, and how it were, I mean, like, the real power is from God. What did, what did Paul say? He said, I didn't come to you with great words and all these eloquent words. I came with you in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That was what convinced mm. people, the power of God changing their lives, people getting healed, people getting set free, delivered. Um, free from being possessed, all these things. They saw the power of God. They saw the truth of God's power. And that's why the church exploded in the beginning days, because they saw that it was real power. And it wasn't just something, you know, goodness. It, it wasn't fake or, you know, all about them. It was about yeah. God. And so we, we've stopped that. We, just like you said a minute ago at TED Talk, we've wanted to craft the perfect message when Paul's like, it's not about me. It's about the power of God. And we've lost that. You know, I had a friend of mine when I was, uh, I was working a job. This was several years ago, pre-COVID. And um, he was just walking, <laughs> walking through the hall. And it was a relatively um, Christian company that I was working for. So most of the people there knew God. And, um, but this guy walked down the, the hall and he said, man, wouldn't it be great but it was just like it was in Acts where God was actually healing people these days and you could see the power of God. I mean, wouldn't it be great? I'm so sad that that doesn't exist anymore. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a second. That, that does exist. We're just not doing it right. We're not, we're not tapping into God's mm. power. We're not doing that. And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, we, we've prayed. He said, I've prayed for my daughter. We've had gone to church and prayed for a daughter. My daughter's never been healed. And it's just that belief. Jesus said, you know, he, he went to his hometown and it said he could do no great work except maybe heal a few people because of their unbelief. We've just come to a place where we've stopped believing in the power of God. We stopped believing mm -hmm. that God is real, his power is real, that he does want good things for us. And so, and we and inadvertently, we've pushed the world or we've pushed people into the world. Well, go find your spiritual stuff in the world because we don't have it here. And that's the opposite of what yeah. should be happening. We have the real power. We have God himself, the, the creator of everything that lives in us, and we have his hands and his feet and our hands and feet, we're, we're supposed to be going and laying hands on the sick. We're supposed to be casting out demons. We're supposed to be showing God's power to the world to set people free from this world of darkness. And, and that needs to start changing now. And so, anyway, that's kind of well, how I... Well, this is so sweet. I mean, you know, yeah, this is just sweet, man. It's so cool to have somebody on our podcast who's just so like-minded as we are. I mean, that's, that's, you know, Lindsay will testify, I mean, that's that's our our drive is is we want to see the real power of God come and what what happens though I, there's just like two groups there's one group that that goes crazy with it and everything is something and, da, 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 and then there's another group 
that basically any kind of power is is counterfeit. But what I don't think they understand about the word counterfeit is you only counterfeit something that's real and valuable. You don't counterfeit so, three dollar bills. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and so and so. So we, we equate, it's oh, it's new age. No, it's not new age. The new age have stolen it. We need it back. Exactly. We, we, exactly. we need it back. And, and, and anyway, and so, you know, that, that's why I, I appreciate, I love Native Americans and Indians and their culture. And what I appreciate the most, I tell Lindsay this all the time, what I appreciate the most of it, I have Osage. Is it Osage Indian I have in me, Lindsay? I think, anyway, he knows more about me uh, than I do. Arkansas, <laughs> uh, up in the Ozarks, in the, in the Osage up there. Yeah, where the, o- the Osage were there. Yeah. yeah. So. so that's what I have in me. And that, that bloodline, they believe in the supernatural worldview. Now, it's messed up, and it's got wrong things, and it's not biblically based and all that stuff. But even now, you know, they still believe in the supernatural, and that puts us one step ahead of a lot of Christians in our walk with Christ. You know, I've heard people say, you know, uh, I can't believe in this, or I can't believe that. I mean, you believe in a virgin having a baby and him dying on a cross and 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 forgiving you of all your sins. I mean, what what mind blowing universal power did it take to do that? And we can't believe somebody yeah. can get healed. <laughs> anyway, sorry, uh, you just you just let like let me get on my hobby. No, that's here, great. So. <laughs> but but uh, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I have a quick question that i want to ask um do you think or do you see a danger in fantasy rpgs like DD exposing people to the occult or how do you feel about that i mean you talked a lot about DD, and i used to play it as a kid too back in the 80s and (laughs) what's what's your viewpoint you know that's a that's a tough one um yep well and 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 i would say that some people may not see it as a tough one but I, i think with anything Anything can be taken too far. Um, anything can be twisted. Yep. So it really depends on, on how you do it. Now, um, it's kind of like, I would just say, really, the, the ultimate answer is just go with the leading of the Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit. It's like, if you, if you don't have a yeah. piece about doing this, then definitely don't. But if, if you don't feel any conviction from the Holy Spirit, then you're probably not getting into any danger. You can there. I mean, there's definitely a super dark side to the D and D world, but there's also a super yes. tame side too, where you can just make up your. You, you have the control with that game to create whatever world you want, and you can create it as dark or as wonderful as you as you can. Like, um, um, I have we have played it with my boys when they were younger, but I wouldn't let them be evil characters, and I wouldn't let them do yeah. certain things. They had to very you know, I was kind of strict in how they did it, but you know, that's a tough question because right. I, I do think there's an opportunity with things to go a dark place if you let it. And if you don't follow the guidance of the Holy spirit, I mean, it's kind of like with action movies, there's action movies that I feel like are probably mm. safe mm-hmm. and tame, but then there's some where it just goes too far and you, you shouldn't watch those things. Um, there is, there is, we are things that I do believe what you see, what you you know, what you digest, what you will, you, you will ultimately become like that. If you spend too much time in that, that's why God's like, Hey, stay in my word. You need to be spending all your time as much as you can yeah. feeding on me and, and hearing my stuff because we have a tendency to drift if we if we're not careful. Um, so, but it, it is a tough one. I would say ultimately you just have to be praying and ask God. I know some people would be like, no, that's 100% evil. Stay away from it. And there's other people that would say, you know, it's 100% fine. But man, that's a tough one. It can go to a dark place, but it can mm-hmm. also be used in a good way. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, do you do you feel the same way, or do you think I'm off on that, Lindsay? You want to go first? Give him your thoughts. I agree. Yeah, I, I mean i I had I didn't play D and D very much. You know, the times I did play it, I enjoyed it, and I played other RPGs later. I played like a sci fi one. Yeah, I mean it. It's where they the the. What's the term for them? The dungeon master or the game master? They decide how dark, I guess, it's going to be, and they don't have to take it in some dark occult, tapping into actual entities' place, you know. And it can just be a fun game you play with your friends. Yeah, and and that, that's yeah. how I see it too. It can get that dark path, but 
it's, it's all what you do with it and where you take it. I kind of feel the same way. Well, it, to me, it all goes back to intention. Intention is not a new age word. Intention is a state. It's a Christian word. It's the difference between, you know, I'm loving somebody because I'm supposed to, or I'm loving somebody because I'm being intentional to. And intention is, is so, I think, important, particularly with RPGs and, and all these gray, gray areas. And how I usually tell people is back when I was younger, first got saved, I've been a Christian for almost 30 years. And so when, when I first got saved, uh, there was, a, there was, it was, everything was black and white, black and white, black and white, you know? And as I've grown and as I've gone through like a dark night of my soul and depression and different, just different life experiences, I've really come to see that there's a lot of gray. Now there's still black and white, but there's gray too. And we can't see that gray because only God can see the black and white and the gray. We're fallen human beings and we see gray. And so that's where I think a lot of this stuff kind of falls in, you know, even though there is still black and white. And it, and like you said, it could be black or white for another person. I mean, I have a friend of mine who can't listen to Pink Floyd anymore because he thinks about when he used to trip on LSD and all that stuff. And I respect that. I love Pink Floyd. I play the guitar and I, I love David Gilmore's riffs and stuff. I appreciate the music aspect of it. And and so music is my thing. Um, I, I basically don't like CCM. I love worship music, but I don't like contemporary Christian music very much. And so what do I listen to? Well, I listen to blues. I listen to jazz. I listen to classical and I listen to metal. I mean, I mean, every, <laughs> see, and, 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 that's exactly and, how and, I see it too. And I'll go, I'll, yep. I'll go some places, you know, when I was a kid, I saw all the metal bands in the eighties, White State, Crew, all of, I mean, all of them, you know, but when I go back there, I don't go back there to a dark place. I go back there to a, I was a young teenage free place and it's a nostalgic type event. It actually is what helped the Lord use to pull me out of my depression is music. And I tease Sandy and Lindsay all the time. I feel like my life is like a mixtape. Everything I've been through in my life, I have a song attached to it, you know, and I don't want to lose that. And yeah. <laughs> God understands that. And he gets that. And that's me. And uh, I'm at the place where I just want to tell people, you do you. God has given us some very clear right, wrong, black and white. You know, but in the gray, you do you. Let me do me. And you don't judge me because that's the judgment is worse than what I'm doing. I think we have really downplayed the whole sin of judgment and how powerful and awful the sin of judgment is in the body of Christ. And that's just a hobby horse I'm on now too. And, and I do understand a place, you know, you don't want to, to cause other people to stumble and, and, and I get that. And, but then there's also this place where I've told people that, you know, weaker brother needs to grow up and mature. If somebody's always weaker brother or if a group of people is always weaker brother, they're not maturing in Christ and going from milk to meat. A, a buddy of mine posted on Facebook this morning, we don't need to separate friendships based on theological disagreements. It's the ultimate of immaturity. You know, it, to some people that would be considered like liberal and I'm by no means liberal <laughs> in any shape, form or fashion, but to a lot of people that's, you know, and, and what I do, uh, there's a Frank Viola is an author that I, we interviewed on here for his book, but I'm reading his book insurgents. It's a really great book, but he, he says it like this. There's two ditches, you know, you, you got you to gotta keep yourself, you're, you're walking down the road, you got to keep yourself out of the two ditches. The one ditch is, is legalism and the other ditch is libertinism. And, and you, however, you know, with the discernment of the Holy Spirit, and I think God wants us to have relationship. And, and in that relationship, that's where we get the knowledge of what's good for me and what's bad for me. It's almost yeah. set up <clears throat> like he has it set up. He wants, he wants us to rely on him and his, our relationship with him to navigate these things. Does that make any sense? No, that does. I, I, you know, I love the fact that you, you've just mentioned that intention aspect and that's, that's really how I see it. Just like, um, just like you're saying it, I don't, well, I mean, really with music too, it's like music has never been an issue. I've been a musician my whole life. So I've always loved music just like you. I'm not a fan of contemporary Christian. What do you, what do you play? I, love, uh, I play, I play guitar mainly, but I can also play piano and drums and, um, my dream, a side dream, just a little side dream, is to have a little jazz band someday. <laughs> sure, but, Ooh, I love jazz. Yeah, love I do jazz, too. Man. But see, I love yeah. blues, jazz, yeah. rock, and and I there there's been like so because I'm a musician, I really never focused on the words of any of the music I listened to when I was younger. Um, I always just like like the music, like the sound, like the riffs, like the flow, where it goes. Hmm. And um, yep, 
There, there's yeah. been a handful of times where I would say, oh yeah, I love that song. Did you like that song? And I'd start to go, oh, have you, have you not read the word? The words are horrible with that song. I'd go back and be like, wow, I never noticed that those, I never noticed the words. <laughs> and so there's a handful of songs. That, there's a handful of songs though, where I really feel like God's been like, okay, don't, don't listen to this. Or I'll, I might put on something that guys like, yeah, you shouldn't listen to this. But for the most time, I do think there is liberty in that. And it does, just like you said, none of it takes me to that dark place musically, but it does my brother. He doesn't like to go just like your friend with Pink Floyd. He doesn't go there. Yeah. So there's that liberty. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you an example. The other day, Sandy was, we were, we, I listened to music at night and the Pina Colada song came on and I love that song. And then Sandy has, you ever listened to the Pina Colada <laughs> song? Do you know what it's about? <laughs> I'm like, no, because I just, I like Pina Colada. You know, I mean, it's like, you need to listen to the words, baby. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, I yep, just, I feel you. I, and it's funny. I just realized what the words were about a year ago. I had the, almost the same conversation with my wife. That is hilarious. I had no idea what that song was about. And then I, I listened. I was like, what? That is so funny. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't know what it was about either. So Ryan. <laughs> Tongues. I thought tongues played a pretty important. You mentioned it a fair amount, speaking in tongues in your book. And um, I just wondered if you could speak to the importance of that in the life of the believer. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's crucially important. One of the things that Jesus told the disciples was before they went and ministered, after he ascended, he said, you know, go and wait in Jerusalem. You know, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of that power being on you will be speaking in tongues. And there was a time mm -hmm. early in my marriage where, um, you know, it almost ended. I mean, a couple of years into it, we were having some struggles. And I think most people do. So it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's just kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. However, I truly believe 1,000%. I know that's not really a thing, but um, the, as much as I can possibly say it, <laughs> praying in tongues, praying in the spirit and praying to God, praying that the prayer language is what save my marriage, praying yeah. whatever I needed to pray at the time. Cause I didn't know what to pray. I was reaching out to God and I just yeah. felt like, okay, I can only thing I can do is pray in the spirit. And I would just spend hours praying in the spirit because I knew I had blown it. I had messed up. Um, you know, my wife was seeing it one way. I was seeing it another, but we were at odds and all I knew is I didn't want it to end. And so just allowing the, the prayer in the spirit, praying that, that perfect will of God, praying, you know, directly to God and praying exactly what I needed at the time. What does it say? It's like, you know, I pray as the uh, Lord guide my prayer. God as a spirit gives me utterance to sit, to pray what I need. I, I truly believe that saved my marriage. I prayed that into my marriage and that, that power came into, and, and it saved it. And 20 years later, it's a testimony that, you know, stands firm. And actually, I think after that time period, after that three years into it, our marriage just got better and better every year. I mean, it just, you know, of course we've had up and downs like anybody, but I would say it's still super strong just because of that. that I mean, literally like it was months and months of just seeking God and praying in the spirit. So the evidence of having that power, um, and, and there's been many times, I know that just from other people's experiences, there's, there's been times where um, there was an emergency about to happen. I had a, a pastor friend that kind of said it like this. He, he, uh, he, he was on a vacation with his, with his kids and a car came out of nowhere and almost hit his son. I'm talking, it was like it, the car could have hit his hair and like literally just barely mm. able to jerk him out of the way of this car. And, uh, and it, really upset uh, my pastor friend. He was like, what happened? How did this happen? And he sought God on it. He was distraught. He sought God. And he was like, God, what was that? How did this happen? You know, I believe you for protection. And he, and he said, that was such a close call. And God told him, he said, look, that wasn't a close call at all. He said, don't you remember a week before when I had you pray in the spirit for all that time period? He said, you were praying over that situation and praying protection in that. You prayed that protection. That wasn't a close call. That was, you know, supernatural protection. He was saved, mm -hmm. but because you spent that time in prayer, you were able to stop that plan the enemy had by praying in the Spirit and praying that perfect will of God. So 
I believe it's just crucially important. I, I think every Christian needs to have that experience. And it's as simple, in my opinion, as literally what God says. He says, if anything you ask in my name, if you believe you receive it, you'll have it. You know, if a father gives a good gift, how much more will I give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And it's simple as saying, hey, Lord, I ask for the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And, and I, I think it's just one of the most important things you can do as a Christian is get that uh, filling of the Holy Spirit and being endued with that power. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to shout out to your wife Amanda. She's awesome, by the way. You have an awesome wife. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> at the same time, uh, yeah, I feel, and I'll let you pop in, Lindsay. I don't want, don't lose your thought, but I feel like tongues is really important. And I have one reason, one major, major reason. The devil hates it. It is the most contentious when it comes to the gifts of the spirit. It is the most contentious, argumentative, fighting. Thing that people argue and fight and fuss and are afraid of, of, of any other gifts. So that gives me a clue, you know, because the devil always overplays his hand. That gives me a clue that it is super powerful. And I'll leave it at that. What were you going to say, Lindsay? No, I was just saying I tend to agree with what he said. That is, yeah, it is, it is important. It's important to me and something I kind of was on and off about since I've, I've been a believer and, and just in the last few years recovered kind of the um, experience of and and just the elevated view of. So, yeah. And it was there, good to see that. And look, yeah, yeah. It, it was. It, it, and there are tons of times, at least in my life, because I'm a hot mess, I guess. I, I don't know how that word goes. I don't know if that's only women or whatever, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, me- I'm a mess. And tongues is the only way I know to pray. You know, it, tongues and help me, Jesus. I mean, those are my two go-to prayers for stuff. And you'd think I've matured to such a mature Christian, you know, I could eloquently pray. But, but uh, you know, praying in the Spirit and help me, they're just my, my go-to. And I've seen God do, do amazing things. I had a mentor, a priest friend of mine, who actually got me in the discipline of, of do it, praying in tongues 30 minutes a day. I haven't done it in, in several years, but I still pray pretty often. But, but that when I was doing that 30 minutes a day, praying in the spirit, it was amazing. The things that, that God would just kind of orchestrate, you know, and I had no idea what I was praying about, but you know, so yeah, it was really refreshing to see that in your book that, uh, because that's a supernatural gift. And, you know, you go in somewhere where there's a lot of a cult or this, that, and the other, and you don't know how to pray. You just pray in the spirit. I, I do it in places that feel hinky. We go to New Orleans and we're walking down certain places here, there, wherever. I, I pray in the spirit, you know, and and then we go, Lindsay and I and, and my wife, we go prayer walking to pray with people, pray with the sick, and and we pray in the spirit. And it's just such a powerful gift that I know that's why the devil hates it. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think well, I think that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So, um, I don't know where you sit with eschatology or any of that kind of stuff, and I'm about to find out, I suppose. <laughs> um, you know, how, 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 how far into the end times deception would you, would you say that we're at this point? You know, because, you know, I, I see the occult. When I'm just you to set. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, de- no date setting. But, but do you, do <laughs> you feel that, that, that we're, we're close, or are you a preterist, or probably I mean, partial preterist, and and think that you know? I'm just curious because uh, it seemed like in the book you 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 saw a lot of this occult stuff creeping in and being you know like a like a precursor towards the end type stuff. So anyway, I'll leave it with you. What do you think, Ryan? Wow, you know, you know, that's a tough one as well because you know I've had this conversation with my wife a handful of times. Um, because it is, a, it is an interesting time that we're in, we are seeing tremendous signs that would point to, man, we're, we're close to the end. Jesus is going to come back any minute. It, it would almost appear that that's, I mean, you could, there's a whole slew of things that you can just point to. However, one thing I've noticed since COVID hit, right around that same time period, it seems like pre-COVID, more, almost everybody was on the same page with things concerning what their beliefs were. Uh, concerning end times. But then once COVID hit, I noticed a separation. I noticed that I had um, 
Christian uh, or, or pastors and teachers that I like to listen to um, that all of a sudden they started disagreeing on topics. They, one, some people would go one direction, some would go the other, and they all still, you know, I would say they all were great men of God, but they all had a different thought process on where we were, what was happening. And I was like, what is going on here? And I kind of, I heard someone say this really interesting thing. It's like, you know, if there's a, if, if, if you were to look at a, uh, a basketball and, and let's say you were, you know, a handful of you were surrounding a basketball and it was a worn, dusty old basketball, but you, you were told to, to describe your basketball and everyone describe your basketball. You may say, okay, well, I'm looking, we're all looking at the same basketball, but there's a little speck of dust right here. And the other guy's like, wait, no, 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 no. I'm seeing a little tear over here. And another guy's saying, no, I see where they patched it on this side. And it's, and it's kind of, you know, worn through. It's not orange on this side. It's more white on this side. They're all looking at the same ball, but they're seeing different aspects of that. And so we, we have to realize that we're, what God wants us to do is all to come in the unity of the faith. You know, we know all need to be not in agreement, yes. but unity in the faith. Amen. And so yes. we need to understand yes. that just because we see it a little differently doesn't mean we're not looking at the same thing, we're wrong. And so that's kind of how God helped me kind of come to terms with that. I was like, man, how are they seeing so many different things? How is this person thinking this? And this person's thinking this, but they're still great men of God. So the verdict's kind of out with me. However, I do. There, there is a, there is a, a, a teaching that I heard um, recently. Well, I would say when I say recently, within the last year or so, last couple of years, a teaching I heard that kind of makes me lean a little more toward we're not exactly where we think we are in the end times yet, um, that we are going to see kind of a, mm-hmm. a change here soon. But um, mm-hmm. the uh, um, kind of like we, we see a... Like a shift? No, it's more like um, kind of like an impression of things to come, uh, an impression of something to come. Mm. Like, for instance, if you go back and you look at uh, 9-11, you can see elements. Foreshadowing? Yeah, you can see foreshadowing of 9-11 in, in Revelation really clearly. You can see a lot of it. And it's like, wait a second, why am I seeing this now? Are we in the end times or is this just a foreshadowing of what's to come? What is this? And I think what we're seeing now is kind of like that. We're seeing imprints of things to come. You can go through the beginning of Revelation and point to, um, you could almost make a case that, you know, there's certain writers of the apocalypse that have already happened. You can, you can point to a lot of different things, but is, mm-hmm. is that the real event or is yeah. that the impression of the event? Is that the impression of the event to come making a way for, uh, making a way for the, in, in the future? Is it kind of like a a precursor to things to come? Mm. So I've heard some teaching that makes me lean toward that being a greater possibility than at any moment Jesus can come. Now, I do believe at any moment Jesus can come, but I don't think we're there yet. And I I think the fact that we're seeing seeing, um, kind of like that revival fire starting to rise. We're starting to, you know, Asbury and and Mm. then other churches, we're starting to see that. I I think we're going to see more of people coming back to God and the power of God start to flow differently. And I think we're going to see a lot of the stuff that the enemy would like to put into the world now and like to accomplish now. I see we're going to see that being pushed to the side and, and, and kind of stifled for the moment. And I, I feel like we're going to see the power of God rise mm-hmm. in a mighty way. So I don't think we're there like we're seeing. My opinion is with some of the stuff that we have experienced, my belief is we should have already been raptured, in my opinion, just based on my understanding of it. But I don't know. There's, once again, there's still a lot of debate. Um, there's more than one side to this basketball. It's a tough topic. It really is. There's people that are adamant. I mean, I'm talking, they get div- divisively adamant. And I just think that's wrong. I don't, I don't mm-hmm. think that's, yeah. that's where we should go at all. Yeah. Yeah, it breaks my heart. I have a. It's like Jesus has given me this heart that uh, the body of Christ needs to work together despite all that. Because I mean, at different parts of my journey, I've been a partial preterist. I've I've been when I first was saved, I was a dispensationalist, you know, and and now I'm I don't know what I am. But I really like what you just said about the impression. I mean, that that's fascinating. I'd love to find out more about that. So that that's that's really really fascinating. Well. 
Ryan, man, this has been a great discussion. I really, yeah, I've really too. enjoyed Thank it. Thank you, guys. Um, and we have, we have kind of a tradition before we land the plane of, of asking, what, what's the most supernatural experience you've had since you've been a believer? You know, it's probably just in the vein of seeing the mercy and the power of God. It's not been in the darkness. I, once again, um, toward the close of my book, one thing that I learned and, and saw and understood, and it was such a, it was such a, uh, such just a, a, a mind shift in a way. It, it just was such an awakening in, in my thought process when I heard a guy on the radio come on and talk about how he had authority in Christ and that he had authority over the enemy, that we've been given the power to tread over serpents, scorpions, mm -hmm. over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm us. And so I've not seen the, the dark side. Now, I, I, don't get me wrong, I've seen it in, in the sense of it trying to, to do things, but I've not seen that side of that uh, supernatural side, the dark side of it, since I've been a believer because I shut it down and I don't stand for it because we have mm -hmm. to be taking mm -hmm. uh, this world for Christ and we have to be the voice and we have to be speaking and, and stopping the plans of the enemy with, with the power that God's given us. But at the same time, the supernatural things that I've seen as a believer has just been the mercy and the power of God and healing. Um, I, I know there was, and this is just a very small thing. This is a very small thing. But um, I had, this is going to be, this is so silly, but at the same time, for me personally, it was so powerful. Um, I had flossed my teeth and I had gotten a piece of floss stuck down in my tooth. It had broken and I couldn't get it out. And it mm. was, it, it got so painful and, and it, to the point where I was like pleading to God because I had prayed and I was like, Lord God, you say in your word that you bore our sickness, you carried our pains by your stripes, we're healed. I, I take your healing. I believe that you, you died for my healing. So I receive it. And it, it, a week had gone by and it was getting worse and worse. And I, I was like frustrated. I was like, God, what is going on? And I literally heard um, this voice, I mean, just on the inside, the still small voice on the inside, it said, I heard God say, let patience have its perfect work. And I was like, what? And it just dawned on me. There's power in that patience. That patience is a supernatural power that, that brings God on the scene. And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I, I immediately was like, oh Lord, I already am healed. I received that. And I just totally was able to give that to God. Literally later that day, mm. it was gone. I don't even know where the floss went. It was just gone. Supernaturally, it left my mouth. Mm. And, it, and my mouth was completely healed. And that was just one small thing. But I've seen, I, just, I could go on and on about little times like that where just the mercy of God was there. There was one time where my child, my younger child, all of a sudden he was choking on something. And my wife called me and said, he's not breathing. He can't breathe. And, and, and she had called the ambulance. The ambulance was on the way. And I said, I told my wife, I said, let's just stop and let's just pray. Let's take authority over this. And we prayed. We, we bound the spirit of the enemy. We, we bound that. We commanded his throat to align with healing and free breathing to be restored. On the phone, he literally took a deep breath and all of a sudden it was fine as if nothing happened. We still don't know what was causing it, but the ambulance sh showed up and she was like, he went outside and we, she said, hey, he's fine now. Everything's good. But just the power of God, which takes me back to what I said earlier, we need as a church to understand that power of the Holy Spirit, that we are the hands and feet of Jesus, that we are the ones to bring the good news of the gospel. Mm. What is the good news? That he died for our healing, for our salvation, for our deliverance, to give us that power to live in this world as kings and priests with God and, and take the, the world for him. And so. I've just seen the power of God. That's the most supernatural I've seen is how God comes in with his love and his mercy every time. And it's not something we earn. It's a free gift of God that's ours. And it's just like what Jesus said. It's like, don't fear, only believe, only believe. And so that, that's kind of just how I feel is that, I mean, how I see it is that, you know, it's the supernatural power of God that's, that I've seen time and time again. And that's, that's bigger and bolder than any super evil stuff I've seen in the past, hands down. Yeah, that floss story is not 
small at all to maim a good one. <laughs> Don't think about how scary it can be thinking about losing teeth or tooth problems, man. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Well, that's God is good, man. I, yeah, I thought about the when you were saying that that the scripture. I'm not. I don't know its address, but I know it says it says uh, faith and patience inherit the promises. So yeah. I think it's in Hebrews. I, I, I want to say, but anyway, I thought about that scripture. And you know what? That was an excellent way to end this podcast with the sharing of the gospel that Jesus died for you. What do you need? And and it's not just that. That's that's how we start out. What do you need? But then. It, it evolves into what are you going to be and then where are you going to go? And I think that we have to embrace what Jesus wants in our lives. He wants, he wants all of us, and he wants all of us because he loves us, and he wants to take us to that new, that new Eden one day. You know, we, we go to heaven when we die now, but, but one day we'll be able to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Eden, and he wants to carry us there. And thank you, Ryan, so much for sharing that that the gospel at the end of that. I do want to ask you this. If they want to get in connection with you, how can they connect with you? We'll put all this in the show notes too, but uh, are you on Facebook, IG? Um, also, I'd like for you to tell us about your other books as well. Well, okay. The, the first book I wrote is a book called God's Love, God Loves Children. And it's just a children's illustrated story about God's love and, and, and salvation, how to get saved. And from a rhyming very innocent way to look at it, a childlike view. So it's, it's just a small children's book. You can find that on Amazon as well, but it's called God's Love, God Loves Children. And it just shows, it just helps a parent um, help, it helps the parent help kids understand uh, what salvation means for, for a very young child, what it is, what God did, and, and how to get saved as a, as a child. So that was the first book I wrote. The next book, the, the book we just talked about the book that I wrote a little ways off. And of course, you can find both of these at on Amazon.com. Um, they I do have it through Kindle Unlimited. So if you have a Kindle Unlimited s- subscription, you can download them and read them for free um, with that subscription. But you also can buy it. I do have paper book and hardback in a little ways off. It's only um, online for the, for the God Loves Children. But I do have paper book, hardback, and you can download it on Amazon.com. I do have a YouTube page. Ryan C. Anderson is the YouTube page. If anybody okay. does want to email me, they can. Um, and, you know, this is going to date me, but I like the fact that it's so easy. Ryan C. Anderson at Hotmail.com. If anybody wants to reach out, feel free to reach me there. The third book I'm writing is a book God put on my heart. And it's actually, it's kind of interesting. It's a pre-telling of Genesis, but from pre-man. What is kind of like, it's going to be written in a fictional format, but it's going to be basically be kind of an allegory about pre-creation. What happened with, you Mm -hmm. know, with Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer? You know, there's a lot of scriptures that go into detail about a pre-man world where there were cities, there were, um, all kinds of things, but there was no man. Um, it talks also about how Lucifer, mm. when he was filled with violence, when he fell, when he rebelled against God, how he destroyed the cities. There's a lot of fascinating things and a lot of detail about a time period pre-man. And so I'm writing a story in that, that um, vein about what happened before creation all the way through, and it's going to be a story from the beginning of like when God created the angels all the way through to now. And it's going to, my, my goal is to make it a uh, kind of like a mm. 10 to 12 series book, but I'm, I'm really excited about it to, to see where it goes. But there's just some fascinating revelations that I've, that God has shared, you know, through other teachers and, and so forth that are, that have helped create this. But I really feel like it's going to be a neat thing to show to kind of go back really in a vein of what your podcast and several others are talking about some of the unexplained, um, the, the mysterious things of the Bible, because the Bible itself is super fascinating. If you understand it and, and go back to some of the original yes. Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, you see things that, that um, are, in my opinion, I think they were purposely hidden. You know, people's bias, you can excuse some of the translations mm. to people's bias, 
But I think some of it was purposely hidden and it was uh, influenced in a negative way to stop people from understanding the true supernatural aspect of the Bible and the true craziness of all the things that happened um, from when God created, started creating things to now. And so um, that's, that's really the reason why I'm writing it, to help open people's eyes to kind of, in the same way that you guys are doing the show and, and many others. Um, so I'm excited about that book too. Yeah, well, we are too. I can't wait. Uh, I, it really piqued my interest. I'd love to read it. So thank you so much, Ryan, for being on our show. And uh, when you write that new book, hopefully we can have you back on it, promote it, and, and get your, your pick your brain about it. So that sounds great. We appreciate it so much. Well, thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you guys for having me on. It's been amazing. It's been great. Thanks for listening and supporting us. And remember, stay naturally supernatural. Thank you.